Holy Spirit is here. Amen. You can feel His presence. It's tangible. If you's up, you just need to jump in the river if you haven't felt it. Jump in the river. Amen. Well, Kim has asked me to sing her funeral song. <laughs> How about that? Yeah. And she said, I got friends coming from North Carolina. I want you to sing my funeral song. So uh, she said, you got to sing this at my funeral. And uh, she said, don't dismiss the kids because she said they get really mad when you sing this song and you dismiss the kids. So how many knows that one day you are going to die? And how many wants to be known for something more than what you just had? Amen. And so I sang this a few weeks ago at a lady's funeral, and it was, it was powerful. I mean, you could feel the presence of God. It's not your normal funeral song, okay? And I need your help, and you just need to worship with me as we sing this, all right? Okay? So we need to get some rhythm going here. Between the pages of an old family Bible, I found dates of births, deaths in old revivals. When I came upon a page, it was written in a feeble hand, said these are my last requests, and this is my funeral plans. Oh, when I die, let me die speaking in tongues. Let it ring in their ears all these songs I've sung. Lord, give me the strength to praise you. Speak your name one more time. Then have your angels carry me over to the other side. Well, Lord, I've lived a long life, and now my race is run. I can't wait to leave here. I got nothing left undone. I've got everything in order. Tell my children not to cry. Because I've left them a road map. And they can meet me in the by and by. Oh, when I die, let me die speaking in tongues. Let it ring in their ears. All these songs I've sung. Lord, give me the strength to praise you. Speak your name one more time. Then have your angels carry me over to the other side. This is my favorite one here. Go tell my friends and neighbors. Tell them not to weep for me. You see, I'm going to live forever. I've finally been set free. Tell them not to mourn. Or to miss me when I'm gone. They can shout all around my graveside. Because this ain't my final home. Oh, when I die. Let me die speaking in tongues. Let it ring in their ears. All these songs I've sung. Lord, give me the strength to praise you. Speak your name one more time. Then have your angels carry me over to the other side. Should we sing that last verse one more time? You know it now. You sing it with me. Ready? Go tell my friends and neighbors. Tell them not to weep for me. You see, I'm going to live forever. I've finally been set free. Tell them not to mourn or to miss me when I'm gone. They can shout all around my graveside because this ain't my final home. Oh, when I die, let me die speaking in tongues. Let it ring in their ears all these songs I've sung. Lord, give me the strength to praise you. Speak your name one more time. Then have your angels carry me over to the other side. Hallelujah. Give him praise. Give the Lord the hand clap this morning. Give him praise this morning. He is worthy, isn't he? He is worthy of praise. Lord, give me the strength to praise him. That's what I pray for. Amen. 
I pray, God, give me strength to praise you. Amen? That's good. That's good. Kids may be dismissed, and have my family come pray with me, if you would, please. If you would just stretch your hand this way and pray that God would use me. Father, Lord, I thank you and praise you for who you are. I thank you for all your blessings. God, you are so good. And Lord, I ask right now that you may increase in this building. Lord, that we may lift you up. Because Jesus said it, you said if you be lifted up. And that's our job. So Jesus, help me to lift you up this morning. Hide me behind the cross that they might just see you and see your words. And we've already heard it this morning. Your word does not return void. And we stand upon that promise this morning. That's all I've got to stand upon here. So I ask this morning that you would speak to each and every heart. We thank you. We praise you for who you are and what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God is good. Man. I love the presence of the Lord. It's something that's addictive. It's addictive. I've never been addicted to anything. Except maybe a rock star is those, those energy drinks. <laughs> I, drink them, I drink them sometimes. I'm trying to, I'm kicking the habit, okay? I, sometimes I get a little tired. I just drink a rock star. But, you know, <laughs> there's confessions of a cowboy pastor right there. Oh, sometimes you need to put a muzzle on this right here, Tim. You know what I'm saying? Oh. I want you to ask yourself this morning, what are you chasing? What are you chasing? Because everybody chases something. Everybody chases something. Whether how old you are or how young you are, you always chase something. There's always a dream. There's always something in your life that you're chasing. I believe that. Don't you? Uh, when I was young, I, I, I grew up, I listened to country music. My dad took me on the road. When I was, well, he's a truck driver. And I went on the road with him. 13, 14 years old, and he taught me to listen to country music. Now, he taught me a lot of good things, but that was one thing that was like, oh, man. And I had to break that habit in my life, and it was so hard. And I would listen, ride in the car with my mom, and I'd put country music on. And, and I, I still to this day, I love the sound of it, you know. And that song, when I, when I wrote the title of this out, What Are You Chasing?, that song that came to my mind was, Daddy Had a Radio. Turned it to a country show. I'm thinking, oh, that's the wrong. Chasing that neon rainbow, you know. But you are. Everybody's chasing something. It's true. Do you ever think about that? Alan Jackson was chasing that neon rainbow. Still is. You know? So how many has heard that a day with the Lord is like a thousand years? Amen? So there was this man, right? And he read that in the Bible. And so he prayed and he asked the Lord. He said, Lord, is it true? Is a day with you like a thousand years? And the Lord said, yes, son, that's, that's right. And he said, well, Lord, can I ask you another question? He said, what's a billion dollars to you? And he said, son, it's like a penny. He said, well, Lord, can I have one of your pennies? And he said, son, just give me a minute. <laughs> It'd take a while to catch on. It's all right. It's all right. We're in a cowboy. No, I'm just picking. I love you guys. It took me a while, right? But everybody's pursuing something. You're pursuing something. If you be honest with yourself and you look at your life, you're pursuing something. Even, our, even the American Declaration of Independence, you know, it's, it's in there. That's famous line that everybody knows. The life pursuit of what life life and the pursuit of happiness it's we've been taught that since a child life liberty and the pursuit of happiness but i'm here to tell you this morning there's no life outside of jesus there's no life outside of jesus amen there's no liberty outside of jesus Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? There's no liberty because who the Son sets free is free indeed. And until the Son sets you free, you're not free. 
So life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the only time you'll find happiness is when you're seeking the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Amen? So I've got, I've got a good word. and It's like the Holy Spirit walked me around this week, and because the last couple of weeks, because we've moved three people in the last week. I was like, wow, it's, it's like everybody's moving, and Kelly's going to be moving. I'll probably go help him here, you know? And I was like, but I'm literally picking up hundreds of pounds, you know, thousands of pounds and carrying people's lives and, and my life too. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not above this, all right? Because we, we had a 48-foot trailer, box trailer full of stuff that was getting ready to move to Colorado with us. And over there, we unloaded a lot of that, okay? We just said, we're just done with this. We haven't used it for two years. It's going to the yard sale. We'll sell it. And, and but, but as I was picking up all this stuff and moving all this stuff, there was, that's my reality. The Holy Spirit that's just started speaking to me. And in Exodus 20, 17, it says this. It says, you must not covet your neighbor's house. You must not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. Now, I want to talk about covetousness and what, what are we chasing what are we chasing? And I'm not, okay, I want to talk to you this morning. I want you to understand I'm not preaching at you. I'm preaching with you because I struggled with this too, and I still struggle with this to some degree. Amen? Okay, so don't think that I'm coming down on I never want to be a preacher that, that says like, man, he really blistered my hide. I'm blistering myself as well, okay? So we're all getting blistered. <laughs> Turn to somebody and say we're all blistered. That's right. I preached a sermon a, a, few, a few weeks ago. Remember that? The lieutenant said, we're all shot. Shut your mouth, get in the truck and drive. And my mom's like, I can't believe you said that from the pulpit. I was like, well, that's the way it is. When, you're, when it comes to being offended, we've all been offended. But I'm telling you this, we all will fight with, with covetousness in our life. And it's, and it's very, very, very serious. It is. Okay? And I want you to understand this. I want to lay a foundation right here, okay? A foundation. That every law, every rule, every commandment, or however you want to see it that's written in the Word of God is written for your happiness, not God's. You understand that? The commandments are written for your happiness, not God's. God's going to be happy no matter what. He is. He's a, he's a good, good father. And so many people think, if, well, if I keep all the rules and I keep all the regulations and I do all these things, I'll keep the big guy upstairs happy. That's not so. It's not so. Well, if I be good enough and I do all this, he'll be more pleased with me. He'll love me. My worth will go up. That's not so either. He wrote all these things for your happiness, for your well-being. A lot of people don't look at that. They look at it maybe he's just a meanie. That's not true. But I'm talking about covetousness. And we all deal with it. Covet means to strongly desire. And I'm going to say this, desire in itself isn't a sin. You understand that? God came to give you a life and life more abundantly. It's not wrong to want a better job. It's just, it's, bad, it's wrong when you want that job so bad you'll do anything to get it. Or you're not happy where you're at. Amen? See, a lot of people think that Christians should live a poor, beat-down, humble life. I don't believe that. Jesus didn't die to make a bunch of mediocre Christians. He came to make us victorious. We are the head, not the tail. And I'm not a prosperity preacher, but I'm just telling you this morning, if you walk uprightly before the Lord, not one good thing will He withhold from your hand. Amen? Amen? It's just you gotta you gotta do that first part, walk uprightly. Amen. It's good stuff. So I'll cut right to it. Covetousness is like this: is I see it, I want it, I gotta have it. And that's how most people live their lives. Amen. We buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. <laughs> It's my conversation. I'll say it the way I want, all right? <laughs> this might not be your problem. That's okay. It has been mine. It's been mine. I'll just be honest with you. 
You realize the first sin that was ever committed was covetousness. Adam and Eve in the garden. Eve, God said, God stacked the odds for them. He said, you can have all these trees. You can eat the fruit from all these trees. But this one over here. I mean, he made it as easy as he could on them. Do you, a lot of people think, well, why did he even put that tree out there? But he made it as easy as he could. They had thousands of trees to eat from. He said, this one right here you can't eat from. But Eve, Eve desired it. She wanted it more than anything. I'm not putting all the blame on Eve. Adam was stupid enough to eat it too, okay? But it's true. Genesis 3, 6. I'm going to back it up with Scripture and you'll see this. Watch this. You might not have seen this before. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eye and a tree to be desired. Remember what I said uh, covetousness is? A strong desire. A tree to be desired to make one wise. She took the fruit thereof and did eat and gave some to her husband. And he did eat. Watch this. The trait was passed down. Did you know you, tr you can pass down covetousness to your children? God showed me this this week. In Genesis 4.4, the story of Cain and Abel. Genesis 4.4 says this, Abel also brought the firstborn of his flocks and their fat, and the Lord respected. Now that word respected means to look intently or be amazed. Okay? The Lord respected Abel in his offering. But he did not respect Cain and his offering. <laughs> See, we often think that he didn't accept it. That's not true. He just didn't look at it amazed. He didn't look at it intently. He didn't respect it. <coughs> didn't say he didn't accept it. That's big. You, you, you got to realize that's big. And so the next verse explains this. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why is your countenance falling? If you do well. Okay, that word well means be happy and content. So if Cain, if you're just happy and you're content, if you'll just be happy and content, watch this. You will, you will be accepted. And that word accepted means elevated. That makes a whole different story on that a meaning when you start thinking about it. God accepted his offering, he just didn't respect it, which means he didn't look at it really closely, didn't give him the attention that he wanted. But so if you'll be happy and content, God will elevate you. Covetousness does that to us. <coughs> it's when we look at something, yeah, and uh, we want it. We want it more than anything. Thank you. That song always gets me. Cuts my throat out. Thank you, Jen. <clears throat> so everybody here struggles with this in some form or fashion. I want you to get that. The opposite of coveting is to be happy and content. Listen to what God said to Cain. Cain, if you do well, all you got to do is be happy and content. Cain coveted the praise that God gave Abel. And, caused, and coveting caused him to be angry. It caused him to be proud. It caused him to hate his brother. It caused him to murder his brother. It cost him his relationship with God. That's pretty serious, isn't it? When you think about it. And you're like, you know, covetousness made the top ten list. For God's top ten list. Covetousness. We don't think about it. We don't think about it a whole lot, do we? Be honest with yourself. You haven't thought about it a whole lot. But that's a lot of the issue in America today. Covetousness. And you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Tell me that covetousness is this bad. Let me, let, me, let me just give you some verses to show you how bad it is. Remember, I'm not picking on anybody in here. You want, I want you to understand that. When, I, when I'm saying it's my, my fault, my, my issue as well. But 1 Corinthians 5.11 says this. But now I have written to you to keep company with, do not keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral. Well, that's pretty big, isn't it? Sexually immoral. Or covetousness. He put covetousness in right when sexually immoral. Isn't that crazy? And an idolater 
or a reveler, uh, which means abusive, or a drunkard, or an extortioner. That's someone who cheats people. That's pretty big. It's pretty big companies hang with, isn't it, covetousness? Ephesians 5.3, listen to this, but fornication in all uncleanliness or covetousness. There it is again. Let not be named among you as fitting for the saints. Colossians 3.5, one of my favorite books. Therefore, put to death your, your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. How about that? That's when you want something. And you put it up there so high, it's an idol. See, we don't walk around using throwing out the word covetousness this t- today in today's society, do you? Uh, I coveted that or I coveted this. We don't say that usually in our, in our vernacular. But what we do say, which is a word that you'll understand, and as soon as I say it, it'll flip the switch on for you. You ready? Materialistic. Did it flip it? Did you see it? Materialistic. We got issues with that. America is very materialistic. And as I was carrying all this stuff around this week, (laughs) as I was carrying my own stuff around this week, I'm thinking, man, this fits the bill for me. Amen? See, we're impulsive shoppers. Look what I saved. Look what I saved. I bought this on sale, right? 24 easy payments. Let me tell you, there's no there's such thing as easy payments. If it was so easy, you'd pay cash for it, right? Huh? Three types of people in the world. The haves, the have-nots, the haves, the have not paid for their haves. And that's true, right? I'm just, I'm just being honest with you, okay? I'm going to be open. This is the stuff that... This is the stuff that hinders you walking close to God. It's serious. I know that that we have fun and we laugh, but it's true. I want you to understand how serious it is. It's something that creeps in on you. You don't even know it. You know? Materialism causes us a lot of issues. It causes us worry. You know, America is more fearful than any other country, but it's also the most materialistic and most blessed country in the world. Did you know that? They call it a phenomenon how much fear is in America because we worry about our things. We fear. We fear. How are we going to keep it? How are we going to get it? How are we going to keep it once we get it? Right? You wear yourself out with material things. Proverbs 23, 4 says this, Do not wear yourself out trying to get rich. Be wise enough to know when to quit. Hey. Covetousness has a lot of, lot of twins, a lot of friends and a lot of twins. Remember I always say like fear and uh, pride and, and all these things go hand in hand together and they're twins? Well, covetousness has some twins. You want to hear them? The twins are comparing, complaining, and contention. That means you're always fighting. Can you see it? They're like twins. They walk hand in hand with each other. And many people view all their troubles as money. It's not money. (laughs) You got a big, big God. Amen. And I want to I'm getting to the good part, okay? I know this was kind of kind of rough, it's like getting sucker punched all the time when you're thinking about it, but I'm getting to the good part. And I'm telling you the only the opposite of being covet being covetousness and having materialistic is to know that Jesus is the only one that satisfies. Amen? We used to sing a song. I want to learn. I think the choir should learn it. There you go, Chad. There's a plug for you. Song, who can satisfy my soul like you? Who on earth could comfort me and love me like you do? Who could ever be more faithful and true? I will trust in you. I will trust in you, my God. There is a fountain who is a king, victorious warrior, and Lord of everything. My rock, my shelter, 
my very own precious Redeemer who reigns upon the throne. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. Amen? Who can satisfy your soul? Nobody but Jesus. And I've got, I'm not going to just leave you with an issue. I want to give you some solutions, okay? The first thing, the first shovel, the first plow that will dig out the root of covetousness. You ready for it? It's thanksgiving and praise. Man, I've been, I've been, I've been just chomping at the bit to preach another uh, sermon on praise because praise will change your life. When you start being thankful for what you got, amen? When you start praising the Lord and you start lifting your hands and say, Lord, I praise you, I magnify you, I thank you for what I have. I thank you. I thank you for my family. I thank you for, for the job I have right now. Not when and then, when I get the job, then I'll praise him. Or, or, you know, or I get the house, then I'll praise him. It's now. David said, today is the day. Amen? This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? I love that, don't you? Turn to somebody and say, I'm too blessed. To be depressed. <laughs> my dad used to say that. If you'd have known my dad, you, you'd, have, you'd have loved him. He, was, he said more things off the wall than I did. He really did. But I can remember him. He, he was full of cancer. He was a good, good man. God had healed him of cancer one time miraculously. I don't, I, don't, I don't pretend to know how God heals and how he don't heal, okay? I know he can. And I know he's, he wants to. But I don't, I don't understand because... I know that this man was full of cancer from the, from the top of his head to the sole of his feet. The doctor said he's got no hope. I mean, they gave him six months and said, that's it. I mean, the lawyers came in. Everybody came in and said, you, got, you, mean, you really got to set everything up. You got to set your affairs in order. That's how serious mesothelanoma was. And, and then I remember he was sitting in a chair, and, and I got the phone call. I was living in Pennsylvania at the time, and... He was praying for, for, I don't even know why I'm going off of this tangent, but here we go. Okay, turn to someone and say, hold on for the ride. That's right. So he, he was sitting, and he was full of cancer. I mean, they have CAT scans and CT scans just to prove it. That, I mean, he had stuff all through his body. And I remember, I remember being in Pennsylvania, and he'd come up and visit and be like, oh, my word, he's, he, he really is. Because you think you're your dad. My dad was a strong man. And I'm thinking, man, he'd nothing ever take him down. But I watched him get weaker and weaker. And uh, he was sitting in the chair, and, my, and everybody would call him for healing because my dad had a lot of faith. He just believed. He was childlike in his faith, and he believed. When he prayed for you, he believed. And so people would call him from all over. And my aunt called him said, I'm getting, David, she said, David, I'm getting cataract surgery, and I'm pray, pray for me that, that, that the surgery will go well. And so my dad started praying for her. And, and he said, the devil came and just sat on his shoulder and started whispering doubt in his ear. He said, the demons, he said, I know they were. He said, this is exactly what they said. He said, here you are dying of cancer, full of cancer, and you're praying for this person to be healed. And my dad said, I put it out of my mind. And he said, I just kept on praying. And he said this. He said, I remember when I said it. He said, Lord, if she could just touch the hem of your garment, I know she can be made whole. He said, something went through me like lightning. And my mom said, when he walked out of that back bedroom, he lit up like a light bulb. And they took him back in. They had a CAT scan that next month, and it was completely gone. I wasn't there for it, but I was in Pennsylvania. But I remember... God gave him five more years, and he gave him enough time that my family got to move down here and, and know my father. And I believe that's what it was for. He died eventually of cancer. I, like I said, I don't know how God works and how he doesn't, but I know he healed him that time of it. But I know he also died of it. So I'm not here to say I've got all the answers. But I know we got a good, good father. Amen? Isn't that so good when you know that, when you can rest assured in that? Man, I love that. But anyway, I, was, I said all that to say this. I said, in the last stages, he, he would, he'd swelled up. The fluid was going in around his organs to protect the organs from cancer. He'd lean on the counter like this. And my buddy, Daryl Gaskins, came in. And he said, how you doing, David? And, and everybody would ask, you know, when someone's really sick, you don't go in and say, how you doing? 
you know, I've got to learn this myself because I go in to visit people in the hospital. How you doing? I'm like, well, I shouldn't really ask that, should I? But he was leaning. I'm learning, okay? I'm learning as a pastor. But he would lean on the counter, and, he'd, and, and he had a little, little beanie on. And, I mean, he weighed about 300 pounds, but his frame was only about 160 pounds. And he'd say, I'm too blessed to be depressed. He said, God's been too good for me. I've learned to praise through that. You need, you, need to, you need to look at your situation and say, I'm too blessed to be depressed. Amen? You've got so much to thank God for. Have you got some, something to thank God for this morning? Everything. Amen? 1 Timothy 6.6 6 says this. It says, true godliness with contentment. True godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. Isn't that wonderful? If you're you're going after God and you can be content, you've got great wealth. That's where it's at. After all, we've brought nothing in with us when we came into this world, and we can take nothing with us when we leave. So if I have enough food and clothing, let us be content. Amen? The best way to be content is to count your blessings and not your cash. The best way to be content is to count your blessings and not your cash. Amen? You may have lots of cash, or you may not have lots of cash, but you have tons of blessings. Amen? Because if you're sitting in this room right now, and you're not sitting in the ICU, you've got something to praise God for. Amen? When I get a raise, I'll be happy. A lot of people have that. They have that when and then mentality. When I get a raise, I'll be happy. I'll give God praise. When I get a house, I'll be happy. I'll give God praise. When I get a new car, I'll be happy. I'll give God praise. No, you need to praise Him now. You need to praise Him now. Praise will change your life. Amen? Praise Him. Praise Him in the middle of construction. (laughs) Praise Him in the middle of raising a family. Amen? Be content with the job that you're working at right now. If you just do well, that's what he told Cain, if you just do well, be happy and content, I will elevate you in due time. That's what he was saying. Listen, if you got food, clothes, and a roof over your head, you're richer than 75% of the world right now. Did you realize that? If you have any money in savings right now, any money at all, you're in the top 8% of the world's wealthiest. If you woke up this morning and you got your health, you're more blessed than 1 million people that aren't going to make it this week. Wow, huh? And if you've never suffered agony of torture or pains of hunger, you're better off than 500 million that live in this world. You've got something to give praise for. Amen? And I need to be reminded of this every day. I'm right there with you all, okay? I'm grateful. Turn to somebody and say, we need to be grateful. Grateful. The second thing I want you to understand is money's not the source of your satisfaction. It's not. Because it's really easy to do that and to get that in the mindset. If you don't think so, Jesus... Th- the Jesus has 38 really, really good recorded sermons. I mean, all everything Jesus said, every word he said is amazing. But 16 of the 38 sermons that he preached had to deal a lot with money. Because he knows what we deal with. Okay? And I'm not preaching at you. I'm preaching with me. <laughs> remember, that, remember that movie, It's a Wonderful Life? You know? Oh, you need to watch. That's great. I love that movie. But George Bailey at the end, you know, he he had stayed in this little town and he had he had worked and and he had given out he had given he he wanted to go bo- abroad and travel, but he stayed at this little tiny bank and helped so many people finance their homes and everything. And at the end, when when he was losing his house, everybody showed up at his house and gave money. And remember, remember his brother said, "To my brother George, the richest man in town, 
And that's what it is. We have so many times we have it in our mind that money is the answer of our, all our problems, but it's not. Money don't satisfy. Money can buy you medicine, but it can't buy you health. Amen? Money can buy you a house, but it can't buy you a home. Money can buy you companionship, but it can't buy you friendship. Money can buy you entertainment, but it can't buy you happiness. Money can buy you food, but you can't buy an appetite. It can buy you a bed, but it can't buy you sleep. And money can buy a little cross, but it can't buy you a savior. He's not for sale. He's free. And he said, whosoever, whosoever will come to him. He said, and, and just lay their burdens on them. I will give you rest. There's, there's contentment in Jesus. Jesus satisfies. Jesus satisfies my soul. Amen? That's good, isn't it? This is good stuff. Aren't you thankful? Don't, don't, don't rest assured in your money. Don't rest assured in your strength. You're only one stroke away from not being able to make any decisions. Hey? Amen? Your safety needs to be in Jesus. And you need to get that down. You need to get it from here and into here. My safety, my satisfaction, everything that I am is in Jesus. I place, we sang that song, All My Hope is in Jesus. That's what sets us apart from all other religions. Amen? Is Jesus. A lot of, all of them believe in God. You know, at my dad's funeral, they played that song. Remember, remember my king and I, and in the middle of it's a recitation, it said, uh, what's that one? He goes, uh, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. See, that's what makes the difference. Everybody believes in God. Believe also in me. Jesus said that. Jesus is what satisfies this morning. Amen? Listen to me. This is something I really dealt with in my life, and I continue to deal with. And I want you to understand, I would not be your pastor this morning if I hadn't heeded to this next verse. I would not be your pastor. I, I, was, I was in Pennsylvania, and you, I know you've heard the story, but I'm going to tell it again because you need to hear it. And you, you need to understand, I can only tell you what did, Jesus did for me. But I was, I, was, I was working in Pennsylvania. I was making really good money. I had a really nice house. I was doing ministry. What I thought I needed to do. I was going around playing and singing at tons of churches everywhere. And I, I was well on my way to be a very, very wealthy young man. And, and my mom and my dad had come up to visit me. And my mom was sitting on the couch. And I was, getting, I was coming down about 5.30 in the morning. I was getting ready to go to work. And she had been up, and God had given her a verse, and she was crying. She was sitting on the couch. And she told me this verse. It's Luke 12, 15. She said, this is the verse I have for you. She says, and this was Jesus speaking, he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist of the abundance of things he possesses. That life changed, that, that verse right there changed the course of my life. When I heeded it. Because I said, okay, God, I'll give in. Whatever you want me to do, I will do. And I knew he wanted me to move to Tennessee. I was moving here without a job with three kids. And I had to tell my father-in-law who owned the company, I'm taking your three kids, and I'm going to Tennessee. He thought I was crazy, probably. I don't know exactly. I never asked him what I thought. What he thought. I'm going to ask him next time he comes down. What, did you, what was you going through your mind when I told you that? But... I'm telling you, that verse, when, when the Holy Spirit pricked my heart and showed me that, it changed the course of my life. And if I hadn't changed it, I would not be your pastor today. That's how serious covetousness is. It's pretty crazy, isn't it, when you start thinking about it. This verse changed it. It changed my life. <laughs> Good stuff, isn't it? I guess I'm being real bone flat out honest with you this morning. You just get to see everything in me. There was a worldly philosopher that wrote these words, and you'll all know them. Okay, you ready for it? I can't get no satisfaction. Because I tried, 
and I tried, and I tried, and I tried, but I can't get no satisfaction. You know who that worldly philosopher was? Mick Jagger. That's right. <laughs> but it's true. That's what the world looks at, don't they? Don't you? What are you chasing this morning? What are you chasing? Jesus is the only one that satisfies. I'm telling you. You need to start investing in your family, investing in the things that are really important. Every now and then, I've got to, I've got to do a tune-up. I've got to step back and say, am I putting my investment, am I investing where I need to be investing in my life? Many people are losing their family, they're losing their marriages, and they're losing their friends by chasing a position or, ch or chasing a property or chasing material things. Just being real, okay? People are more important than things. People are more important than things. Love people and use things. Don't love things and use people. Did you get that? I'll say it again. Love people and use things. Love thi not, do not love things and use people. Okay? I know I had to say it again because I had to make sure I got it right. In the last days, people will love only themselves and their money. That's what the Bible says. That's what Timothy said. He, Paul wrote to Timothy. And some of us, myself included, we need to invest more in our marriage more into our children, more into our family, more into our friends. We invest in 401Ks. We invest in everything in our lives. But you need to invest in those because that's what really matters. Don't you agree? And the greatest investment, you know what the greatest investment is? Time. Not money. Time. Hey, right? I, I love the verse. I use this quite often. Jesus said this. He said, lay up your treasures. He didn't say don't lay up your treasures. He said, go ahead and lay them up. You know where you're supposed to lay them up? In heaven. Where moth and rust and this world can't can be corroded. What greater treasure can you lay up than your friends and your family? I want my family to go to heaven. I want my friends to go to heaven. I want everyone in this church to go to heaven. I do. That's my desire. But I can't do it if I'm chasing these things of the world. Right? It was a command, not a, not a suggestion, when Jesus said that. Lay up your treasures. It was a command, not a suggestion. So do whatever it takes. My last, last little bit here is this last little tiny bonus, just a real short one. Is be content. And to be content, you've got to be eternally minded. Eternally minded. Nothing else will do. Nothing else will do. What are you chasing? There's an illustration that I like to use. Francis Chan was the first one that I saw ever use it. And it's of a rope. And you can imagine, if you take a rope and you string it all the way around this whole auditorium... And then you take a little tiny piece of red tape and you put on that rope. And you, and you look at that piece of red tape. And this is your lifeline. This is your life compared to eternity. So what are you living your life for? What are you chasing? Are you chasing to try to get, well, if I get the better job, I get the better the house, I'll be so happy. I'll be content. I'm living for, living for now when you got all this other that you need to be preparing for. Amen? It's so good when you start thinking about it. I love you. This is why I preach this way. I can, I can preach you happy and clappy. I could. But when you leave, it's not going to help you. 